approached what became known as the Ulster question. Um, particularly between 1918 and 1922. Now, you'll appreciate that these are tumultuous years incorporating a variety of different controversial events, and I'm not going to seek to do justice to them all. Uh, what I want to do instead um, is to try and illuminate certain strands or certain currents um, that were relevant to how Sinn Féin uh, approached the question of Ulster, or the Ulster dilemma, or the Ulster question, as it was most, most frequently um, referred to. It raised all sorts of complicated questions that still resonate, of course, to this day. They're still controversial to this day and indeed commemorating uh, the centenary um, of the creation of the state of Northern Ireland has proven, of course, to be difficult, uh, as indeed was the 50th anniversary um, in 1971. So I'm very conscious that these uh, particular periods of reflection uh, can in, in sometimes obviously uh, reopen uh, particularly tricky questions or old wounds, uh, but they can also offer us an opportunity to uh, seek to try and complicate uh, various narratives, uh, to look at the evidence that we have and to try and put context uh, on these particularly uh, difficult questions. Uh, the Ulster issue both tormented and propelled uh, Sinn Féin during this period to some very definitive public declarations about what was involved uh, in the Ulster crisis or the Ulster uh, dilemma. Um, a word that was frequently used in relation uh, to this issue was indivisible. The idea that the island of Ireland was indivisible, it was an indivisible unit um, and should not in any way uh, be partitioned. That certainly was a consistent uh, argument that was made by Sinn Féin. And I'm reminded of the words of probably the most high profile Republican priest in Irish politics uh, 100 years ago, Father Michael O'Flanagan, who was one of the vice presidents of Sinn Féin. Uh, and he asserted that the boundaries of Ireland were marked by the finger of Almighty God when he surrounded it with the circling sea, and that there could never be any dispute about those boundaries. And that was a typical declaration uh, about the idea of an indivisible island. Um, that had been ordained by God and could not be interfered with uh, by mere mortals. Against that, you have to be conscious of the gauntlet that was thrown down by a British Liberal MP uh, in 1912, or a former Liberal MP who had become more conservative. His name was Harry Lawson, and he posed this question in 1912. How are you in these democratic days, in this democratic country, to force what he called a million men into a system that they refuse to join. And what he was suggesting, of course, was that there had to be some acknowledgement and recognition and solution to this determined resistance to home rule on the part uh, of unionists, particularly those unionists uh, who were centered in Ulster. And of course, what was interesting about 1912 and 1913 was the extent to which unionism did become Ulsterized uh, as opposed to seeking to maintain an all-island unionist opposition uh, to any home rule solution for Ireland. The focus is, is, is becoming more and more on Ulster, uh, particularly under the leadership of Edward Carson, um, of course a Dubliner, uh, in 1912 and 1913. But that question continued to complicate and trouble uh, Sinn Féin. How are you in these democratic days, in this democratic um, era, uh, to, to deal with this intense opposition uh, to the idea of an all-Ireland uh, solution. And how was that conundrum handled? How was that dilemma faced by Sinn Féin during uh, this period? Historians have offered various verdicts on Sinn Féin's performance in relation to this question. Um, Paul Murray, for example, a historian of the Boundary Commission, has suggested that Sinn Féin's approach involved a mix of hope, fear, pessimism, and illusion. Um, and that's not an unfair summary. Uh, but there were other elements, I think, to it. There was at times a private pragmatism on the part of some Sinn Féiners about uh, the Ulster question, about coming to some form of an accommodation uh, with Ulster Unionists beyond this simple declaration that this was an indivisible uh, island. Uh, it's a political challenge for Sinn Féin, of course. It's also a psychological challenge. And I think that's important. We often talk about the political context for the partition of Ireland or uh, for the circumstances of the creation of a border on the island, but there are also mental borders. 
And there are psychological challenges uh, in relation to trying to conceptualize uh, the Ulster problem. Um, and the events of these years also highlighted much more deep rooted uh, and long held assumptions. Um, if you take, for example, the work of historian Charles Townsend, who's looked at uh, attitudes in the 1820s uh, by Catholic nationalists during the era of Daniel O'Connell, uh, suggesting that they underestimated Irish Protestant grassroots roots resistance as something that was always manipulated from above. They tended not to give enough uh, due attention uh, to the grassroots and sentiments um, of the uh, Irish Protestant grassroots during that early period uh, of the 19th century. Um, there's no doubt that a fair degree of ignorance in Britain about the Irish question and about the circumstances uh, of Ulster, but there were arguably mental partitions that were apparent long before the actual physical border on the island. And to give you an example of that, in 1883, T.M. Healy, Tim, he Tim Healy, agreed to stand um, as a nationalist candidate for the Irish Parliamentary Party uh, in the constituency of Monaghan. And he spoke uh, in Fermanagh, very near the border uh, with Monaghan in 1883. And he said he was speaking to raise the banner in the remote north. Um, and the observation that Charles Townsend, the historian, makes is that that spoke volume, volumes about the perspective from Dublin, that this was being referred to uh, at that stage um, as the remote north. And when he was victorious um, in winning that particular seat uh, in 1883, 1883 uh, he suggested that his victory involved an invasion of Ulster. Um, so not many attempts there, obviously, to assuage the fears uh, of, of those of a unionist disposition. It's very interesting to excavate that language um, and what it suggests, of course, about the confidence of nationalists in relation to the invasion uh, of Ulster uh, and raising the banner. Uh, and yet it's also spoken about as, as something uh, in the same breath almost that is seen as quite remote. Um, and, you know, Protestant fears, of course, became um, very apparent throughout the third home rule crisis, particularly from uh, 1910 onwards when the Irish nationalists form an alliance with the British uh, Liberal Party uh, and it reaches I suppose a uh, crisis point in 1913 particularly with the scale of the Ulster Unionist opposition to the third home rule bill um, their defiance their threat to establish their own uh, Ulster governments their determination to face down uh, not just Irish nationalists but also the British government and this is an era of brinkmanship um, and there's always this question of, of how that brinkmanship is going to be handled. Take the creation of the Ulster Volunteer Force uh, in 1913, uh, both a political creation and a quasi-military creation, uh, a militia group, um, a volunteer organisation. But will politicians be able to control it? Um, similar challenges were faced by Southern nationalists in terms of the formation of the Irish Volunteers. Um, but talk of civil war is not far-fetched. Uh, in Ireland in 1913, in advance of the outbreak uh, of the First World War. Um, and of course, Sinn Féin at that stage is still very much uh, in its infancy. Uh, it's by no means a nationwide movement. It hasn't been successful uh, electorally. Um, and it is not uh, representative of mainstream uh, nationalist opinion um, at that stage. Uh, and there's a lot of talk during this period about bluff and whether or not unionists are engaged in a joint game uh, of, bluff, of bluff. But what was apparent, I think, was not only that unionists distrusted uh, home rule and nationalist political uh, ambitions, they also, of course, had a profound distrust of London. And that was to remain very relevant, arguably has remained very relevant to the present day in terms of their perception of themselves. And that in itself was a challenge uh, to Sinn Féin. Also, Ernest Hamilton, uh, for example, uh, unionist MP, talked at one stage during this period about the need for an independent Ulster, that idea that you couldn't trust Dublin and you couldn't trust London, that there needed to be that reliance on what Ernest Hamilton famously referred to in a book of this title as the soul of Ulster. And that question, of course, is uh, related to Sinn Féin's assertion that it was the keeper of the soul of Ireland. So what happens in relation to those competing claims, the soul of Ulster and the soul of an indivisible uh, Ireland? Um, and, you know, how does 
the Irish Ireland project work for Sinn Féin in terms of these unionist fears and these unionist sentiments is the logical uh, implication of their Irish Ireland agenda, Sinn Féin's Irish Ireland agenda, particularly in the aftermath, of course, uh, of, of 1916, is the logical implication some kind of a separate Ulster, some kind of a partition. Um, and it's interesting to, to look at how uh, they campaigned uh, in relation uh, to their own aims, particularly uh, during the um, First World War. Uh, and in the aftermath of the 1916 rising. And this is largely uh, a product of, of propaganda, how they frame the question as opposed to how uh, they contest uh, elections. It was frequently asserted, for example, that the roots and origins of the Ulster question were not Irish, they were English. The same assertion was often made about sectarianism in Ireland, that it wasn't an Irish uh, indigenous um, um, a product. It was something that had been manufactured uh, by the English. Um, and yet at the, si the same time, uh, we know that there were those in Sinn Féin who privately had a tendency to speak of Northern nationalists uh, as different. Um, take, for example, Joseph Campbell, um, who was a Wicklow Sinn Féin politician who asserted privately that the people of Tyrone and Fermanagh, uh, though they were Republican in politics, are essentially Northern in character. Uh, what did that mean? You pass you know, away, teach me, please. What did Southern Sinn Feiners mean um, by that particular assertion uh, about the essential Northern character uh, of uh, Republicans in that part of Ireland in Ulster uh, at that time? So that sense of a difference, that sense of a separate entity, that feeds into a lot of British responses to the uh, Ulster crisis as well. Thomas Agar Roberts, for example, another British MP, um, who brought up the issue of possible partition uh, in Parliament, suggested that it would be impossible in Ireland to fuse what he calls the two incongruous elements, uh, the Unionists um, and the Republicans. Uh, and John Redmond, even as leader of the mainstream uh, Irish Parliamentary Party, who had been fighting, of course, for, for decades uh, to achieve home rule, he did seem to suggest at various stages that there were two races uh, in Ireland. So there were tricky questions there to navigate in terms of the perception of Ulster and some comments, private and public, which would bolster, I think, the perception of Ulster as a separate entity. Uh, and of course, the First World War uh, changed everything. The very influential role uh, of Walter Long, who was a Wiltshire Tory squire who had led uh, the Irish uh, Unionist, the Irish Unionist Parliamentary Party, who becomes a key Irish, uh, who becomes a key uh, advisor on Irish affairs at cabinet level uh, during the First World War uh, and after, uh, is very preoccupied with the notion of loyal Ulster, particularly in the aftermath of the First World War, given the sacrifices, most famously, of course, uh, at the Somme and the role of the Ulster uh, volunteers and the 36th uh, Ulster Division. Um, and there's no doubt, of course, uh, that the World War uh, changed things dramatically. Home rule, of course, famously had been put on hold uh, at the outset of the war. The 1916 rising was also a product of the First World War and, of course, transformed sentiment um, in Southern Ireland. And it led to an awful lot uh, of declarations uh, by Sinn Féin during this period. And I'll just give you an example of that, particularly when they were campaigning during the 1918 uh, election. It led to an awful lot of declarations um, like this. Is Ireland a part of England? Um, quoting, this is Sinn Féin campaigning in the 1918 general election, the December 1918 general election, the first general election that had been held in the United Kingdom since 1910. And they're campaigning on a ticket of abstention from Westminster. And they're goading uh, the Irish nationalists at Westminster, the Irish Parliamentary Party, including Captain D.D. Sheehan, who's quoted here, um, who at one stage uh, in April 1918 uh, had suggested, um, I know all the English arguments, they only take account of England's position. Uh, they are all founded upon the English delusion that Ireland is a part of England. The logic from Sinn Féin's point of view, and this is electoral propaganda, if Ireland is not part of England, why should Irish members attend the English Parliament, especially when they are outnumbered there six to one, vote for Sinn Féin and show the world that Ireland is not part of England? Um, one of the reasons I'm highlighting this is because uh, a key part of Sinn Féin's approach 
um, to Ulster and to the Ulster question uh, was centered on this kind of propaganda. Um, and yet they also had to deal with the reality of the uh, extent to which the results of the December 1918 election revealed a very divided island. And you can see it there uh, in that contemporary map, uh, which referred to the results of the December 1982, uh, December 1918 uh, election um, in the province of Ulster, the division between Republican, uh, Unionist and Nationalist. Um, and it's quite clear, of course, uh, that Unionists um, are going to command that very significant portion uh, of the vote and political allegiance in uh, the province of Ulster. And you can see the way Sinn Féin characterised it here. Only one voter in five voted for English rule. Sinn Féin could claim, of course, almost 75% uh, uh, of the seats. Um, but the difficulty remained. How do you deal uh, with the one voter in five, uh, particularly given the scale and intensity of the opposition uh, to Sinn Féin's ambition uh, towards a united Ireland? Um, and that, of course, was a challenge for the British government. It was a challenge for Walter Long, who was tasked with coming up with some kind of a solution uh, to this particular uh, dilemma. Uh, dilemma. Uh, and eventually, of course, um, was to settle on the idea of, of two separate entities with two separate parliaments. Um, and again, the interesting thing to think about in relation to a lot of this uh, Sinn Féin propaganda um, is whether or not Sinn Féin was more preoccupied uh, with influencing opinion um, outside of Ireland than it was in influencing opinion in Ulster. There's a very revealing comment, for example, from Michael Collins in the aftermath of Sinn Féin's victory uh, in 1918 and into the beginning of the War uh, of Independence, um, that real progress is to be measured by what is thought abroad rather than what is thought at home. And Sinn Féin does devote uh, considerable attention to, to, to propaganda ab uh, abroad, often to an international audience that is indifferent uh, to the Ulster question. Uh, and there certainly is some delusion uh, in relation to that. Um, but it's worth asking, when the first Doyle convenes in the Mansion House in Dublin in January 1919, and there's a roll call um, of MPs who had been elected, in the December 1918 election, and that included, of course, those who had been elected for Ulster, including the Unionists who were part uh, of that roll call. Uh, you won't be surprised, of course, to learn that they didn't show up uh, to that Mansion House meeting. But did the Doyle's attitude to Ulster resemble a, baffle, resemble a baffled indifference to Ireland so evident at Westminster? Well, that's certainly the argument of Charles Townsend in his recent book uh, on the partition of Ireland. He's very critical um, of the mental partition that was apparent before uh, the uh, physical partition um, and this tendency to prioritise propaganda uh, over uh, proper engagement. Um, at the same time, we have to be conscious that Sinn Féin uh, was aware of the scale of the challenge it faced um, in persuading uh, Ulster. It did in the summer of 1919 appoint specific organisers for the province uh, of Ulster, including Eamon Donnelly. He was later joined by Forbes uh, Patterson, um, and they certainly were charged by Sinn Féin with the task uh, of, of, of seeking to keep uh, the, Sinn, the Sinn Féin flag flying um, in, um, in Ulster uh, at that time. Um, but there's also then another important development, which is the Belfast boycott. And you'll appreciate now here the broader backdrop to this uh, in the context of the um, growing violence and sectarian violence in the spring and the summer of 1920, uh, the riots, uh, the Protestant vigilante groups, uh, later that year the formation of the Ulster, Ulster Special Constabulary. Um, Sinn Féin was under pressure to respond to these particular developments and they decided um, during the course of 1920 to institute uh, the so-called Belfast boycott and this was an attempt to try and bring economic pressure to bear uh, on businesses uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, a reaction, of course, as well to, to what they knew was the formulation uh, of, of, of Walter Long's uh, plans, which were introduced in 1920 to divide Ireland, uh, to offer a parliament uh, to both North and South uh, with the idea of a Council of Ireland that would eventually, it was hoped, uh, bring them together. But here we see uh, an economic weapon uh, and there was no unanimity 
in Sinn Féin about the merits of the Belfast boycott on whether uh, trying to economically punish uh, Belfast uh, was either a wise thing to do uh, or would be an effective thing to do. Uh, Ernest Blythe, uh, for example, the Sinn Féin uh, TD, a native of Lisburn, uh, was very critical of the boycott, uh, deciding that it would destroy forever the possibility of any union, uh, as he put it. Uh, and you can see an example of uh, contemporary uh, boycott propaganda there and, and, and demands um, a warning to Irish men and Irish women uh, in view of the convening of the partition parliament uh, at Belfast. More of that in a moment. It has been decreed that no notes or checks on any of the following banks are to be accepted under any conditions after the 7th of June and included there the Ulster Bank, the Northern Bank and the Belfast Bank. Um, uh, the Ulster Bank is still here. Um, so uh, it, it, it's interesting to look um, at this specific directive. Um, and this was a decree, uh, as you'll see by order of the Belfast Boycott uh, Committee. The boycott was rather erratic um, and not particularly well organised in 1920, but it became much more concerted uh, uh, in, in 1921. The director of the Belfast Boycott was Joseph McDonough. He had a budget of about two and a half thousand pounds. Uh, in 1921, and there were a whole host of uh, enforcement committees, over 300 of them, um, in various locations. How effective they were, of course, is open to question. This boycott was uh, rather intermittent. There certainly were those who were blacklisted. Uh, some business premises were subjected to arson. There were IRA raids uh, on other um, commercial, um, uh, commercial trains that were traveling. Um, uh, to, to south from north. Uh, there was the seizure of Gallagher cigarettes, which, which was an interesting one because those who seized them in the IRA uh, took the cigarettes out individually and put them into new packets that were ironically called slauncha, uh, the Irish word for health, uh, and they were then transported to the Ballykinlar internment camp uh, in County Down, where a number uh, of uh, IRA prisoners um, were held. Um, and there's no doubt that the Belfast boycott, boycott impacted very heavily on wholesale firms uh, in particular. But whether or not, in the words of PSO Hegarty at a later stage, it led to the conversion of a single unionist uh, to Sinn Féin's cause uh, is another question uh, entirely. Um, there was inconsistency and there was resistance to the Belfast boycott uh, in the South. Take the Dublin United Tramway Company, for example, which was frequently being complained of uh, by senior Sinn Féiners because they were actually advertising Belfast companies on the back of their tram tickets. Uh, so clearly this wasn't as successful as Sinn Féin might have wished, but it certainly caused uh, damage uh, to business um, in, in, in North and in Belfast and in other parts. Another major issue connected, of course, to this uh, campaign and to this era is the 1921 election. The election to the partition parliament, uh, as it was referred to in a lot uh, of Sinn Féin literature. Um, now, in the South, on the elections that were held uh, during that era, all 124 Sinn Féin uh, TDs who had been elected uh, in 1918 uh, were uh, returned unopposed. But there is an election, of course, um, in Ulster. There is an election in the new uh, for the new Northern Ireland Parliament. Um, that's complicated too for Sinn Féin by the operation of Joe Devlin's outfit, the United Irish League, the role of the ancient order of Hibernians, the kind of uh, Belfast politics that Eamon Phoenix has written um, in such detail and so skillfully uh, about and the base that he had built up um, with the United Irish League and the ancient order of Hibernians and the, the role of the Catholic Church in that. This was a very tricky terrain uh, for Sinn Féin uh, to navigate. And if you consider Sinn Féin's position in Ulster at that time in 1921, they had just over 250 uh, Sinn Féin clubs in Ulster, but 48% of those clubs were in Cavan and Monaghan and Donegal. Uh, and the number of Sinn Féin clubs in Down and Fermanagh um, had actually decreased uh, in the previous couple of years. Um, now, you set that against some of the uh, demands and confident declarations of the Sinn Féin party. Michael Collins, for example, had argued that they needed uh, the National Party, the former Irish Parliamentary Party, to stand down uh, in favour of Sinn Féin. And he said, if that was done, we can at the outset give partition what ought to be an almost fatal blow. Uh, 
um, there is a sense of misplaced optimism uh, in those assertions. Um, you've also got to consider the media hostility that existed towards Sinn Féin uh, during this period. Three out of the four main dailies, uh, of course, were unionist in sympathy. The Belfast Newsletter, uh, the Northern Whig, the Belfast Telegraph. They sold 140,000 papers a day uh, between them and, of course, were hostile to Sinn Féin. Whilst the Irish News uh, newspaper had remained loyal to the Irish Parliamentary Party tradition, uh, to the Nationalist Party. Uh, and Sinn Féin is also a banned organisation. So it is operating uh, in, in very difficult circumstances and, and difficult terrain uh, during this period. Um, and whilst there is the determination to appoint a director of elections, Martin Conlon is appointed director of elections in February 1921 in preparation uh, for these May uh, elections. He's very quickly replaced by Austin Stack, which would suggest a degree of disarray uh, within Sinn Féin as regarding how to approach uh, this particular uh, election. Uh, there was also a lot of Sinn Féin propaganda around economic issues that insisted um, that would, what would lead ultimately to prosperity uh, for the island was the marrying of the industrial north with the agricultural south, and that that combination would ultimately lead to a prosperous uh, united Ireland. But the more tricky details had to do with negotiating with the United Irish League and the Nationalist Party. They eventually agreed on two fundamental uh, issues, that they would abstain uh, from Parliament if elected, um, and that they both accepted the principle of self-determination. Um, and they chose 19 candidates each to run, um, and they were supposed to support each other in terms uh, of their preferences, because this was an election under the single transferable vote. Sinn Féin also sent in the region of 100 speakers uh, over the course of that election campaign uh, to the uh, constituencies. Um, so you've got to be conscious, I suppose, of, of the effort that they did put in uh, to electioneering uh, and to a scheme for propaganda, as it was devised by Sinn Féin in April of 1921 with a budget uh, of £2,000, and also a propaganda committee that included Erskine Childers and Sean McEntee, um, who was Belfast born, as well as Jenny Wise Power uh, and Hannah Sheehy Skeffington. And they realised that they needed uh, to try and influence opinion through a regular newspaper. Um, and that newspaper was established under the editorship uh, of Sean McEntee. It was tactically named The Unionist. Uh, ironically, um, in order to try and reach uh, a particular audience um, at that time in this, uh, in this election campaign. Um, now, Sinn Féin were also operating in particularly difficult circumstances because of their 19 candidates, eight were in jail uh, and seven were on the run, um, which makes their declarations and their expectations uh, even more difficult to fathom particularly when uh, Eamon de Valera uh, predicted that Sinn Féin would win one third uh, of the seats for the new Northern Parliament, there were 52 seats um, up for grabs, that they would win one third of them, and that with other uh, nationalist seats, we may even secure half uh, of the Parliament's representation. That, of course, turned out to be a wildly optimistic prediction on the part uh, of de Valera. Uh, Eamon Donnelly, the, one of the Sinn Féin organisers, um, in Ulster, who I mentioned earlier on, suggested that the only effect of Sinn Féin literature was to bring unionists out to vote uh, against us. Uh, his post-mortem was particularly gloomy uh, in relation to how Sinn Féin fared during this election. And the results, of course, confirmed um, the strength of the unionist vote. Unionists won 40 of the 52 seats, Sinn Féin won six, the Nationalists uh, won the other six. And there was much carping uh, in Sinn Féin um, about what they regarded as the failure uh, of Joe Devlin and the Devlinites generally um, to live up to the agreements that they had made uh, prior uh, to the election. But there are, during this period and, and during the War of Independence, other aspects that are relevant to the Sinn Féin handling of the Ulster question and the Sinn Féin perception uh, of the Ulster question. They were not always naive or ignorant. There were private recognitions of the need for compromise, for the need of, of, of some kind of accommodation. Uh, there was a Sinn Féin committee, for example, established in the autumn of 1921 uh, to collect and compile and arrange what were called facts and arguments 
uh, in relation to the Ulster question. And this committee's membership included uh, Owen McNeill um, and Sean McEntee. Um, again, two Sinn Féiners, obviously, uh, with Northern uh, backgrounds. Uh, and of the five members of that committee, four were, were from Ulster. There was no cabinet member, however, in the Sinn Féin um, War of Independence cabinet. There was no cabinet member uh, from Ulster uh, in that particular uh, cabinet. But what de Valera was interested uh, in charging this uh, committee, uh, the task he was interested in charging this committee with, uh, was looking at the options, including the idea of county option. That if there was to be what he termed essential unity, um, would it be possible to devise a scheme where individual counties could choose uh, to opt out um, of um, um, uh, a, a, an All-Ireland uh, entity? Could, in other words, there be a continued devolution, the continued existence uh, of a Northern Parliament alongside uh, a Southern Parliament, um, and it would be subordinate to uh, that Southern Parliament? And could ca individual counties choose to uh, pledge allegiance to uh, one or either of those parliaments. What would the practicalities uh, of that kind of a scheme uh, be? There's also interesting contact um, between Griffith and Collins in relation to the work of this uh, committee. And here's where you see, I think, something of a divergence in Sinn Féin's views on the Ulster question. Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins uh, tended to be quite complacent about what they regarded as the inevitability of unity. Whereas de Valera, it seems, is whatever about what he's saying in public is being more realistic uh, in private. There is also contact established with George Russell, uh, the intriguing, uh, interesting uh, and talented Irish writer uh, and journalist um, who was a native of Lurgan uh, and certainly believed in the vision uh, of a single island nation. Um, but he was also somebody uh, who wanted the Sinn Féiners to focus on the economics uh, of this particular problem. The way he put it was that the economic approach is the one where the reasonable Ulster will be the most powerful. Uh, and Russell was talking about such things as an All-Ireland Customs Union, uh, for example. There's also the interesting visit to um, Belfast of Dermot Fawcett. And Dermot Fawcett had served as a Sinn Féin diplomat, a Sinn Féin envoy uh, in the United States. Uh, he has a background uh, in economics. Um, and the point that he makes on his return from his trip to Belfast is that they need reassurance about taxes. Uh, so there was talk, of course, about the economics uh, of this particular situation uh, and how it might work. Um, but there were also those on the executive of Sinn Féin who were worried that de Valera was softening too much. And the way, for example, J.E. O'Doherty, who was the Ulster representative on the Sinn Féin executive, put it, don't promise too much to unionists and certainly do not give control to them of policing uh, judicial matters, uh, life, liberty or civil rights. And the way he put it, if you do, our grievance, Ulster Sinn Féin's grievance, will be against Ireland generally for the desertion of her Highlanders. Um, a very interesting uh, use of language again. Um, the Sinn Féin, Ulster Sinn Féin's uh, problem with Ireland, if it goes too soft, will be uh, the desertion of her Highlanders. Um, there was also an unfinished memorandum authored by Erskine Childers, who I mentioned um, a few moments ago, uh, a zealous convert uh, to the Irish Republican cause, having been a very influential British civil servant uh, and, and, and famous author. Uh, de Valera felt that Childers had a grasp on the Ulster question uh, that was much more comprehensive and sophisticated than many of his contemporaries. And again, he charged Childers with the task of trying to come up with uh, a, a way of guaranteeing what de Valera called essential unity. Again, the idea of, of accepting the continuance uh, of uh, a parliament in Northern Ireland, um, but that you would have agreement about tax uh, and tariffs and you would have no Ulster uh, MPs serving at Westminster and that the Northern Ireland Parliament would be subordinate uh, to the Dublin Parliament. That satisfied de Valera's idea of essential unity uh, for the island, even though there would be two uh, parliaments. Uh, 
Um, so bear in mind these, I suppose, behind the scenes maneuvers and private meanderings uh, that were going on in the autumn uh, of 1921, um, some sort of accommodation with the idea of, of local option. Um, the reason I'm highlighting these as well is because they come in advance of the end of the War of Independence. The ceasefire um, or cessation uh, of violence or the truce between uh, the Crown forces and the IRA in July of 1921. And what follows, of course, is the negotiation of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Um, and this raised particular challenges for the Irish negotiators, this Ulster question and how they might handle it. Uh, it's often been asserted that Arthur Griffith leading the Irish delegation, delegation became impaled on the Ulster Cross. But one of the interesting questions is whether he hammered more nails into that cross himself than were necessary uh, during the negotiation. Um, you also, of course, have the issue of James Craig as the new Prime Minister uh, of Northern Ireland and his dealings with um, David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister. Uh, James Craig's various attitudes and positions during this period uh, suggest a mixture of arrogance and vanity and victimhood uh, when it came uh, to the Ulster question. What he was clearly determined to do in advance of the treaty negotiations was to try and make Ulster impregnable uh, before uh, the treaty. Sitting on Ulster like a rock, uh, in the words of the historian Ronan Fanning, determined that what he had, he would hold. Uh, and he's remarkably successful uh, in sticking to that particular uh, strategy. Um, there's also, of course, on the part of the Irish delegation, a belief that if the talks are to break down, and it's very likely that they will, they should break them down on Ulster because they felt they had a stronger case to make on Ulster and the need for the essential unity of Ireland. And they were thinking in terms of influencing international uh, opinion. They were also thinking about English opinion, which when it wasn't indifferent uh, uh, to Ireland was not particularly uh, keen uh, on the idea of the partition of such a small island, either for political or economic reasons. Uh, and there were many within the British political establishment uh, who, thought, who thought likewise and would have been quite happy to, to hand the whole of Ireland uh, over. Um, so you've got to consider all of these different uh, factors. And we have um, a really revealing um, archive of the treaty negotiations, and I'll show you uh, some examples of that that are particularly relevant uh, to the Ulster question. Um, we also have, of course, uh, the, the, the mention of a boundary commission in private. Um, Craig had mentioned this. David Lloyd George also spoke to Edward Carson um, during this period. Um, this is during the period when James Craig, of course, has, has taken over the leadership uh, of the unionists from Edward Carson. But the idea of a boundary commission um, had been mentioned uh, previously. Uh, what Edward Carson was led to understand was that this would only about be about very minimal changes uh, in order to try uh, and accommodate the preferences, uh, unionist or uh, nationalist of those uh, in particular uh, border areas, uh, but that the British government had given encouragement to those who endeavoured to read into it uh, a different interpretation. Uh, and I'm mentioning that because of the tricks and the shadow language and the individuals speaking out of both sides of their mouths uh, during the treaty negotiations. Uh, this, for example, uh, is a letter uh, you'll see on screen here from Arthur Griffith to Eamon de Valera, uh, who, of course, famously did not go uh, to the negotiations, but insists on being kept informed of every single move of the Irish uh, negotiators, which eventually causes a lot of uh, tension. Um, and here they are at the end of October, with the negotiations having begun on the 8th of October, um, talking about how to crack the Ulster nut. Um, and the conversation was general between Lord Birkenhead, one of the British negotiators and the prime minister. Uh, the gist of it was that if we would accept the crown, they would send for Craig, i.e. force Ulster in, as I understand. Um, and whilst he maintains we have no power uh, to accept uh, the crown, we might recommend some form of association with the British Empire if all other matters were satisfactory, above all, Ireland unified. Um, and of course, when Arthur Griffith writes of Ulster, he always puts it in inverted commas. Um, now, this, of course, is about a determination on the part of the British side that if the talks will break, they will not break on Ulster, they will break on crown. 
we talk in this era today about red lines. This was a red line for the British negotiators. Um, the crown and empire, there is going to be no republic. Uh, but the difficulty for the Irish delegation, of course, is, is, is to try um, and solve this, this, this Ulster problem. Uh, and whether or not David Lloyd George, of course, can force Ulster in um, is a very big question indeed. And it goes on uh, to be a complicating factor. This is, as you'll see, that was the 20, um, 27th of October. This is from the 3rd uh, of November, uh, following my conversation with Lloyd George on Sunday night. Um, he asked me to write him a letter embodying the personal assurances I gave him in order that he might take his stand against Craig and the Ulster men if they proved uh, obdurate. Um, and there was certainly no shortage of views on the obduracy of the Ulster man, uh, including on the part of British uh, government negotiators uh, during uh, this period. Uh, they are satisfied to face the Ulster question and assure me that if Ulster proves unreasonable, they are prepared to resign rather than use force against us. In such an event, no English government is capable of formation on a war policy uh, against Ireland. The tactical course I have followed has been to throw the question of Ulster against the question of association and the crown. This is now the position. The British are standing, the British standing aside, if they secure Ulster's consent, we shall have gained essential unity and the difficulty we shall be up against will be the formulas or of association and recognition. Uh, in other words, um, how we will manage our association with the British Empire uh, de Valera had this idea, of course, of external association through which a free Ireland uh, would associate with the British Empire for defence purposes. Um, now, what you can see going on here, well, there are a variety of different things, including the trickery of, of David Lloyd George. Uh, was the British government really prepared to resign um, in, in relation to this? Um, did David Lloyd George really have the power to be able to force uh, concessions uh, from Craig? Uh, was Arthur Griffith giving personal assurances that were not the assurances of the delegation as a whole? Was there an element of divide and conquer going on here in relation to how David Lloyd George was handling Arthur Griffith uh, and the Ulster question? Um, and a variety of these different uh, forces are, are, are at play. I can't do justice to the complexity uh, and the drama um, and the psychological and political uh, battles that were going on. Uh, but this was the kind of, of difficult correspondence that was going back and forth. Um, and here's uh, Eamon de Valera, um, again, corresponding on this, this question of Ulster. Um, we could go out or, or we could break uh, on Ulster, provided we could so manage it that Ulster uh, could not go out with the cry of attachment to the empire and loyalty uh, to the throne. The difficulty, of course, was to secure this without jeopardizing our own fundamental position. There can be no doubt whatever that the delegation has managed to do this admirably. And if a break occurs at this stage, Ulster will be crushed between the public opinion of both countries, as well as the public opinion of the world, if it counts for anything. Um, well, it didn't count for much. Uh, and again, you can see a degree of, of, of delusion there, but also bravado. And he is attempting de Valera in his own way to try uh, and stiffen the resolve. Uh, of the negotiators, but they were getting pretty fed up with them uh, too. Uh, this view is shared by everyone here so that we should be quite uh, unanimous on it. Um, so this strategy around crown and empire is playing out throughout uh, late October uh, and November. But a further complication um, is this particular document, which is a crucial one. And I'm sorry, the quality of it uh, isn't, isn't very good. It's quite uh, faded, but this was, um, a particular, see a scribble here at the end of it, uh, a copy shown to Arthur Griffith on Sunday, the 13th of November, uh, 1921. It's signed by Tom Jones, who was the secretary uh, to David Lloyd George and kept very voluminous diaries throughout the uh, treaty negotiations. Um, if Ulster did not see her way to accept immediately the principle of a parliament of all Ireland, coupled with the retention by the Parliament of Northern Ireland of the powers conferred upon it by the Government of Ireland Act of 1920, we shall then propose to create such parliament for all Ireland, but to allow us to the right within a specified time um, on an address to the throne carried in both houses of the Ulster Parliament to elect to remain subject to the Imperial Parliament for all the reserve services. In this case, she would continue to exercise through her own parliament all her present rights. She would continue to be represented in the British Parliament and so on. Um, in this case, however, it would be necessary 
to revise the boundary of Northern Ireland. This might be done by a boundary commission, which would be directed to adjust the line both by inclusion and exclusion so as to make the boundary conform as closely as possible to the wishes of the population. David Lloyd George had cornered Arthur Griffith with this particular commitment. I am not going to break the negotiations on Ulster because I now have this committee, this commission, uh, boundary commission promise. Um, now that of course was a job very well done uh, by David Lloyd George, uh, when you consider uh, what it meant uh, in practice, that they could get then get on to the issue of crown and what ultimately became an oath of allegiance, which fatally divided, uh, of course, famously the Sinn uh, Féin movement. Um, there was no Ulster member of the plenipotentiaries, the Irish negotiators uh, of the treaty, and it's worth uh, remembering that as well. Uh, and what ultimately ended up as Article 12 of the treaty was deliberately ambiguous in relation to a boundary commission. Arthur Griffith was inclined to say that this was a commitment to plebiscites, that each area would have the right to a direct vote on whether they wanted to remain uh, under the jurisdiction uh, of the Northern Parliament um, or, or, or the alternative uh, Parliament. There's no such commitment to plebiscites. There's no mention uh, of plebiscites. And Article 12 of uh, the Anglo-Irish Treaty refers to the uh, wishes of the inhabitants being taken into account insofar as may be compatible with economic and geographic conditions. What the hell did that mean? There is no detail. Uh, as to what it means. It's deliberately hazy and ambiguous. It wouldn't have got into the text of the, of the, of the treaty unless it had been uh, ambiguous. Um, so certainly that was a very difficult period uh, for Arthur Griffith um, and we need to be conscious of the pressures that he and his fellow uh, delegates uh, were under uh, during that period. Um, and, you know, David Lloyd George was conscious too um, that he wasn't in a particularly strong position uh, when it came uh, to Ulster. Um, he did, of course, uh, admit, uh, I don't know who will fight and die for Tyrone uh, and for Manna. Uh, the feeling here, he said, isn't as strong as it was in 1913. And yet he was consistent in his assertion that we will not force Ulster into United Ireland against its will. We will not tolerate, in his own words, civil war on our doorstep. Um, so you've got to be conscious of the different pressures uh, that were at work here. But Arthur Griffith stuck to the idea that there were going to be plebiscites uh, that would allow um, those living in the border regions to be able to decide uh, their own futures. And of course, there was a degree uh, of uh, delusion uh, when it came to that. Um, so we've got to be conscious of the fallout, of course, uh, from that. Um, and it really brings me on to uh, my last point about uh, what it meant uh, for Sinn Féin and the Ulster question, and of course those who felt acutely uh, abandoned um, from the prison ship in Argenta, the prison ship Argenta, for example, which was docked uh, in Belfast. Uh, Ker Healy, uh, who was the Sinn Féin MP for uh, Fermanagh and Tyrone, was complaining that we have no light or leading from Dublin. That's a very revealing phrase that he uses, no light or leading uh, from Dublin. And he was later to claim in 1925 at the time of the Boundary Commission that we have been sold into political servitude for all time. That great feeling of betrayal uh, on the part of uh, Sinn Féin in, in, in Ulster. Um, and you also, of course, had uh, Michael Collins and the new provisional government who have accepted uh, the treaty uh, in anguished correspondence with Winston Churchill um, as Secretary of State uh, for the Colonies. Um, the... Uh, extent of the violence uh, and the sectarian outrageous uh, outrages in the new Northern Ireland uh, and the British washing of hands, as well as the financing of the state apparatus. Um, the way Winston Churchill put it to Collins when Collins was sending him details uh, of what was going on, there is an underworld there with deadly feuds of its own. Um, that's a very obvious washing uh, of, of British hands uh, of the Ulster question uh, in that sense. Um, and what Collins and his colleagues tended to rely on uh, at this stage was the compilation uh, of, of, of various um, witness testimonies and the Belfast summaries. Um, I give you uh, an example um, of, of what that meant in practice. And they're very stark, of course, uh, figures. Uh, the Belfast summary for the 27th of December, 1921, the casualty list, 41 killed from the November the 20th to December the 17th, another four killed 
uh, later that month. Uh, and then the detailing of, of various um, issues uh, and, and incidents and, and violent episodes. Um, and this was Sinn Féin's attempt to try and compile a kind of a dossier uh, on, on the extent of what was going on, which of course Michael Collins was sharing uh, with London every opportunity uh, he got. And you also have the individual testimony um, of particular individuals, including Mrs. Bunting here in Argyle Street, uh, who gave birth to a baby on the 9th uh, of July. Um, and the Orange Pogrom, um, as uh, Michael Collins always called it, and the Orange Mob is, is referred to here. I have seven children besides the baby from 14 years uh, to one year and 10 months. So there was no shortage of detail um, on some of the terrors uh, that were being experienced. Um, and of course, James Craig was well up to the task uh, of bombarding Winston Churchill uh, with what he regarded uh, as the true state of affairs uh, in Northern Ireland, or what he insisted was the true state uh, of affairs uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, and of course, the most common insult um, there used uh, by the leaders of these mob um, was that they were attacking Sinn Féin bastards. Um, so these are the kind of difficulties uh, that are being faced um, uh, by um, Sinn Féin when it comes to the Ulster crisis. The death of Michael Collins in August 1922 for some took away uh, a sympathetic voice at the Sinn Féin table or perhaps the most sympathetic voice at the Sinn Féin table. Um, it's interesting that Ernest Blythe, who had supported the treaty uh, and justified um, the use um, of, of force uh, to try and bring about a united Ireland, had changed his tune uh, by the summer of 1922. There's a five-man um, Sinn Féin committee appointed in August 1922, the same month um, as Michael Collins uh, is killed. Um, and the title given to their paper is Peace Policy. And what they are advocating is a policy of peaceful coexistence, that violence is useless for protecting Catholics, uh, in the words uh, of um, Ernest Blythe, and that force can no longer uh, be justified and that coercion would be counterproductive. Um, and again, you do get that strong sense of an attempt to change the policy on the part of Sinn Féin towards uh, the new Northern Ireland. And there's a very anguished letter that appears um, in the archives um, that was sent to Owen McNeill, who's the new Minister for Education in the Free State, by an interned teacher uh, in Belfast in January 1923. And that interned teacher complained uh, about Sinn Féin turning its back uh, on its Ulster brethren. And he wrote, the bitter part is the reflection that when I do get out, I'll be forgotten. And in many respects, he was right. 